Corley, you've never met a man like my father to answer a question with a question. Um, I, I think maybe it was his way of dealing with four inquisitive children when he was bringing us up, but uh, I doubt it. I, I, I feel he probably came hardwired that way. But in any case, it, it was always, and still is to an extent, like being in some sort of extended Socratic dialogue where you'd get, um, Dad, why does that happen? Oh, I don't know. Why do you think that happens? Um, and there must have been something to it because um, my three siblings there are all scientists now of different hues. People who actively seek out what they don't know, who question what they do know in an effort to try and understand the universe better. Um, I'm the black sheep, a politician, and I do the exact opposite, pretending to know the answer to all things at all times, whether I do or not. On clear winter nights, Dad used to bring us outside with a telescope and point it skywards, and, and through it, usually after much foostering around and cursing under the breath, we'd eventually find Jupiter and see the same moons that Galileo glimpsed in or around 1610, a view that challenged the orthodoxy of geocentrism. And Dad would wonder aloud how the father of astronomy would envy the view that we had with all the benefit of what has been learned since. It's apt again that we mark Science Week, and before Deputy Nocton leaves, I wanted to give you a mention, Deputy Nocton, uh, for keeping it on our agenda as an Oireachtas each year. And indeed, I wanted to congratulate you, Deputy Nocton, on your appointment as the chair of the Interparliamentary U Union Working Group on Science and Technology. I think it's always important for Ireland to, to be represented on these international stages. Because we owe so much to the world of the world we live in, to the achievements of science, of what it's unlocked in our lives. Uh, from the polyester in my tie to the broadcast equipment in front of me to the vaccine in my arm, from the inner workings of the atom to the Webb telescope, which looks back to the very dawn of our universe. But I wonder, for all we owe to our scientific community, if we celebrate them in the same way as we celebrate our poets, for example, or our writers. Um, hardly a week passes in here without a quote from an unsuspecting and blameless Irish poet being shoehorned into a speech on something or other. But how often do we quote scientists of note? Um, if I stopped a person in the street, they'd surely be able to name three Irish writers or three Irish sports people or three Irish bands. But how many would be able to name three Irish scientists? We're lucky in Waterford to be able to lay claim to at least three scientists of note who have helped us to a better understanding of the world that we live in. I'll start with Robert Boyle. He's possibly the best known. Boyle's Law, as anyone who took physics or chemistry in school would know, sets out the inverse relationship between volume and pressure in a gas at a constant temperature. It applies everywhere in the universe except to the Doyle chamber, where regardless of the amount of gas expelled, both volume and temperature tend to increase with pressure. Our inverse relationship here tends to govern the relationship between pressure and the length of time before a decision is required. And that's a very niche joke, and I'm very proud of it. Um, CalMAST, the STEM engagement centre of uh, SETU, commemorate Boyle each year, and indeed they play a central role in the celebration of Science Week, that bears mentioning. Uh, they, they commemorate Boyle each year in Lismore and Waterford City with the Robert Boyle Summer School, which, if you needed any further excuse to visit Waterford, takes place next year from the 22nd to the 25th of June. And Minister, I'm sure you'd be made welcome if you decided to travel. Boyle once remarked that the book of nature is a fine and large piece of tapestry rolled up, which we are not able to see all at once, but must be content to wait for the discovery of its beauty, its symmetry, little by little, as it gradually comes to be more and more unfolded or displayed. For all the more we've unrolled that tapestry since then, the tapestry is no less beautiful, though I fear we may be unravelling some of that world at the same time. We in Waterford are happy as well to lay, lay claim to Ernest Walton, um, a physicist and a Nobel laureate, though in truth he lived in Waterford um, for only a short time. He was born in Abbeyside, just across from Dungarvan. It's a very important distinction in Waterford. So we have as much a claim to him as anyone else. And we honoured him recently too in renaming the TSSG Research Centre in Waterford as the Walton Institute, uh, fitting considering the quality and range of the scientific research that happens out in the Carriganore campus of SETU. Walton is best known for his work with John Cockcroft to, dis to construct one of the earliest types of particle accelerator. In experiments performed at Cambridge University in the early 1930s, Walton and Cockcroft became the first team to use a particle beam to transform one element to another. According to their Nobel Prize citation, 
Thus, for the first time, a nuclear transmutation was produced by means entirely under human control. Particle accelerators are now central to the work um, of evolving our understanding of how the universe functions at a subatomic level. And in that context, I very warmly welcome um, the Minister's announcement that the Irish Government will consider this year applying to become members of CERN, where much of that groundbreaking research happens. Walton told us, that, told us that a refusal to use our intelligence honestly is an act of contempt for him who gave us that intelligence. I would say that's a timely exhortation to anyone attending COP27 at the moment. By now, the science is absolutely unequivocal on the subject of climate change, and we must begin to bend the full weight of human intelligence and ingenuity to a challenge that is, in truth, the moonshot of this generation. Because the work of the third Waterford scientist of note I want to mention gives some foreshadowing to the fragility of natural systems we take for granted, which have nurtured our civilizations and our scientific achievements. John Palliser was born in Dublin, but he served in the Waterford Militia from 1839 to 1863. He was a geographer and an, he was an explorer. Following his service in the Waterford Militia and hunting excursions to the North American prairies, he led the British North American Exploring Expedition, which investigated the geography, climate and ecology of what we would know today as Western Canada. <clears throat> his warnings about the unsuitability to agricultural development of the area now known as Palliser's Triangle were ignored. They went unheeded. Palliser reported that the region, including what's now known as southeastern Alberta and southwestern Saskatchewan, was too arid for farming. The area was nonetheless settled for farming, but was subsequently devastated in the Dust Bowl drought, which wreaked such havoc, both economic and ecological, in what is sometimes termed the Dirty Thirties in North America. It's impossible for me to read that without thinking of the pastoralists of East Africa at the moment whose lives and livelihoods are being shattered by changing climatic conditions resulting from human-induced climate change. Scientists have predicted that too, as well. But to return to that little boy in the backyard in Butlerstown looking down a telescope at moons orbiting a distant planet, and one is reminded of the words of another famous scientist, though unfortunately not an Irish one in this case, but Sir Isaac Newton, who said in a letter to Robert Hooke, if I've seen further than you, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. From where we're standing now, on the shoulders of the likes of Boyle, of Walton, of Palliser, we can see further and clearer than ever before, from the electron to the Big Bang. We are the only things, the only entities that we know of in this universe who can ask that question that my father turned back on me, who can look at the universe and ask why. In some sense, we are the universe trying to understand itself. We unroll more and more of life rich, life's rich tapestry that Boyle spoke about, understand more and more the forces and relationships that govern our existence with each passing year. We have a clearer understanding, too, of the challenges that we face. And I hope fervently that we can apply the intellectual honesty that Walton spoke of and apply the learnings of science to protect the fragile environment that allowed the homo, homo sapien, the thinking primate, to make these advances in how we understand the world around us.